Yeah. Okay. All right. Recordings on. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh... Good morning, son. Oh, good morning, mom. <laughs> it's nice. It's nice to see to see most of you anyway. Um, and uh, meaning it's, it's nice to have all of you here. I just keep, some of you I can see and some of you not. Um, morning. Hi, Emma. We're, um, we're gonna take a look today, I'll pull up the text, um, at a piece that Rav Cook wrote. Um, and this, uh, different than the piece that we looked at last time, um, this is not from the collections of his writings that were edited um, posthumously, this is actually um, an essay, uh, or this is uh, the third in a series of essays that Ruff Cook published um, in a in a journal, a periodical journal, um, during the First World War. Uh, he had gone to Europe um, early in 1914, and uh, then with the outbreak of um, the war was uh, basically trapped in Switzerland uh, for the duration of the war. Um, and, um, and it was, um, even for somebody whose thinking was already um, you know, quite innovative, uh, it was a very transformative period for him. Um, you know, I think in a way that um, had he not been quite literally in the middle of things during the war, uh, he might not have experienced in the same way. Um, so what we're going to see is um, all of it is Rav Cook in his own words in the sense that um, the notebooks that he left behind after his death were edited and sequenced. Um, but this is actually, you know, Rav Cook prepared himself uh, for publication. Um, and so he begins, um, he begins by talking about the regular course of simplicity and straightforwardness in preservation of good character and all religion and law are the substantive processes of the world of order. So right away he's, he's setting up a paradigm where he says there is this, I, there's this thing called olam hatikun, the world of order. And all of the kind of the regular course of Tom Yosher, simplicity and straightforwardness, good character, religion, law, all of that belongs in this category that he's calling Olam Hatikun, the world of order. And every deviation from this, whether on account of carelessness or anarchy, or on account of raised consciousness and the arousal of a higher spirit or the substance of the world of chaos. Um, so here's the dichotomy. There's a world of order and that world of order is simplicity, straightforwardness, good character, religion, law. And then there's a world of chaos and any deviation from the world of order is a part of the world of chaos except that there is a great difference in the details of the world of chaos itself in its inclination to the left or right, right? And, and when he says to the left or right, what he means is um, on the one hand, you have deviations from the world of order that are caused by kalut dat behef kerut, um, carelessness or anarchy. Um, and on the other hand, you have deviations from this world of order that are called by, caused by he tore a root ruach el yon, the arousal of a higher spirit. Both of those deviations belong to the world of chaos, but they're not the same. Right? Um, they, they don't function in the same way. They don't um, interact in the same way. Um, so let's just, um, let's just start there, what, um, what questions do you have or, or what's coming up for you as we're seeing Rav Cook beginning to frame the essay in this way? Rabbi, yeah. the, the, the first thing that struck me 
is is um, what is as a term of art, what does chaos mean to Rav Cook? Mm -hmm. Right, and the and the Hebrew word there is tohu, um, which which is the description. Um, you know, I'll never forget uh, one time I was at a lecture with Richard Elliot Friedman, the Bible professor. Um, oh, it's too bad Susan's not on the call. Um, but he had just published his translation and commentary of the Torah. And one of the anecdotes that he shared is um, the phrase tohu vavohu in describing the chaos that precedes God's creation of the universe. Um, he, says, Bo, he says tohu means chaos. Bohu doesn't mean anything. It's a nonsense word that rhymes with chaos. Um, so the first manuscript of his translation that he turned into the, um, to the uh, publisher said, the um, ha'aretz tohu vavohu, and the land was chaos shmeas. <laughs> which, which he said to us, I mean, you know, if you want a literal translation of tohu vavohu, it's chaos shmeas, right? You know, you have a one perfectly sensible word, and then you have a nonsense word that rhymes with it. Um, but the there's something primordial in um, Rav Cook's use of that word tohu, right? It is the, um, it's the chaotic energy that precedes formation. Um, and that's, um, I hadn't thought about it in that way until you asked the question, but this is actually gonna be really significant as we go forward. Um, you know, tohu, is, um, you know, to Tohu is that state right before the Big Bang where the entire matter of the universe is so tightly compressed that it's all the subatomic particles, right? It's like even, even the structure of a proton doesn't exist yet in that space. Um, and so the the chaos that he's talking about is um, is a kind of pre-creation or, or pre-existence kind of a chaos in which um, any kind of distinction or, or distinguishing of things is completely effaced. Yeah, Sheila. Uh, hang on a second, you're still muted. Okay. Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, so I, I, I think you, you just said that formation emerges out of chaos, um, which, you know, leads me to question if, I mean, it sounds from this text as if there is no place for this kind of chaos but perhaps there is. Ah, so, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to question your question, which is, right, like I, I think on some level what you're asking is like, how does, what does Ruff Cook do with this? If he's going to distinguish between the world of order and the world of chaos, um, where is he taking us? Why is he setting up these, um, this juxtaposition, that's gonna be an incredibly, that, that's gonna be the critical question of the whole essay. Okay. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, so let's, so, so I want everybody to hold Sheila's question in mind um, as we go forward. Are there any other reactions or questions um, just to this first slide before we go forward? Yeah, I've got one more question. Yeah. So is the world of order the world as created? Is it the world? Is it the world of Torah? Uh, uh, what is the world? What What is the world of order? Well, so that so that he very that he very helpfully tells us. Um, it is law, religion, morality, um, you know, social etiquette. Um, um, I'm blanking on the name. Who was it? Was it Emily Post? Is that, um, I think it was a, I, Miss Manners? I don't know, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it's like all of this um, finishing school, right? If you imagine, um, 
um, <clears throat> I had a camper once at summer camp who like went to one of these like literally like finishing school kind of places where you have posture classes and um, right like all of that is um, is Olam HaTikun, is the world of order. It's it's anything that and structures and um, and limits. Okay, so this it's a combination of sources. It is whatever it is that creates that world of yeah, order. whatever it is that creates that. Right. So so sure, um, you know, <clears throat> Torah is an element of the world of order because it creates structure and there are rules and there are things you have to do and things you don't have to do. Um, but secular law also, right? The speed limit. The speed limit belongs in Olam HaTikun, in the world of order. Okay. Okay. So this is really broad. Okay. Yeah, it's really broad and on, and on many multiple levels. Rabbi, when, yeah. when you responded earlier, you seem to be using the language of cosmology and the, the terms of cosmology in defining chaos. Um, but it's, it's hard to see, and by the way, I, I totally embrace that, but it's hard to see using that metaphor, how there could be an inclination to the left or right. Um, well, because I think because it's a metaphor, right, which means that it's not actually the like the whole right the whole point of a metaphor is that it isn't actually the thing that you're comparing it to. Um, and so I think what Ralph Cook is saying is, on the one hand, you have order and chaos as a dichotomy. On the other hand, you have two different kinds of chaos because there's a kind of chaos that comes out of <clears throat> carelessness and anarchy, and there's a kind of chaos that comes through the arousal of a higher spirit. They're both chaos, but they're not the same chaos. Um, and not only are they not the same chaos, um, but he actually says, um, um, there's, a, there's a significant difference in the, in the details between the kind of chaos that emerges from carelessness and anarchy and the kind of chaos that emerges from the arousal of a higher spirit. So his, okay. his notion of chaos is not monolithic. That's right, yes. Well, in fact, what he's defining for us here is a, is a duality of chaos. Okay. There's two kinds of chaos, and there's chaos that comes from anarchy, and there's carelessness that comes, uh, there's, um, sorry, there's, there's chaos that comes from anarchy and carelessness, and there's chaos that comes from the arousal of a higher spirit. Now, now he hasn't yet flushed out for us what that arousal of the higher spirit is or why it is that that kind of arousal of a higher spirit um, would take us to a place of chaos, right? I mean, um, I think for a lot of us, when we think about a spiritual awakening, chaos is not the first thing that comes to mind. Um, but, but there's, hey. yeah. I think his use of the word simple is very important. Because if someone sets out to change personal behaviors, it does create chaos in their personal life, even if they're changing for the positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. I, I think that that's true, and it's not necessarily always true. I mean, I'm just even thinking about like, um, I said this the other day, like I've somehow against all odds become a morning person. Um, and, you know, there was, there was all kinds of difficulty involved in getting myself to wake up three hours later than I used to wake up, uh, three hours earlier than I used to wake up. Um, but it wasn't distru disruptive and in fact has, has given me a lot more grounding um, than I had a couple months ago. Um, I, you know, and there are times where the effort to change a behavior can be profoundly dislocating um, and disruptive in a person's life or in many people's lives. Um, you know, think about, um, 
you know, the way in which, um, you know, just for example, a, a person's decision to choose sobriety can ripple through their social circle and ripple through their family, um, you know, in ways that are, uh, mom, I think, as you're saying, profoundly disruptive um, and, and chaotic. Um, and then a new equilibrium emerges, but it, but not every, not every change produces uses that kind of chaos. Um, and some of it even, I mean, again, like if we stick with this example of choosing sobriety, um, it may be from a different frame that, that it's actually a reduction in chaos, right? I mean, you know, again, if we just think about the, the trauma of addiction, um, as disruptive as that choice is to, to choose sobriety, um, it actually very rapidly reduces the the aggregate chaos in the system, even even though it, it remains highly disruptive of all kinds of patterns that have been established. Um, so I think it. So I think it just you know, and, and so then the question becomes: those choices to change that create chaos. Um, where do you know, do, do they fit into the paradigm that Rob Cook is presenting us with? And I and I'd like us all to kind of hang on to that question and just um, reality test it, you know, against our own experience to say, well, what, um, where does this, where does what we're hearing from Rob Cook match or not match what we've experienced in life? Um, so hold Sheila's question as we go to the next slide. Sheila's question was about, um, oh, sorry. Um, oh, we have a, a couple more slides to go. Okay, so uh, he continues, the great idealists want an order so beautiful and good, solid and mighty, that the world has neither example nor foundation for it. Therefore, they demolish what has been built according to worldly standards. Ha'idealistim hagdolim, the great idealists want an order so beautiful and good, solid and mighty. She'ein ba'olam lo dugma v'yesod. The world has neither example nor foundation for it. Therefore, they demolish what has been built according to worldly standards. What, what are you hearing here? What I'm hearing is support for Gandhi and support for King in terms of engaging in um, disruptive um, behavior, even if um, in order to change the world positively. Mm -hmm. and, and what is it, you know, if we, if we take them, it's, it, right, it's interesting because you chose two examples who would have been unknown to Rav Cook. Um, right. King, King, I don't think, was born yet when this was written. Um, but, but what, so what is it about them? What is, it, what is Rav Cook telling us about them, even though he's not telling us about them specifically? But what is he telling us about people like them? Can you put the language back up for? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, I can. I can reshare that. Does worldly mean socially normative, like peaceful protest? Is that what you're saying, Arlene? Is that what you how you're reading worldly standards? No, well, no, I wasn't really, I, th I picked those as protests in terms of being idealists, but I think that the, I th what I thought, what I heard in um, the prior slide, the distinction between order and chaos was that there's an order, there may be an order in the world, um, Mussolini made the trains run on time. 
Um, there was order in the post reconstruction of South. Mm -hmm. but they, but but those um, those worlds um, are not, were neither beautiful nor good. Um, and others want a world that is better, um, great idealists, and they have to demolish what has been built um, in order to achieve that greater good. Well, and, and, and yes. So Arlene, first of all, yes. Um, and, and, and more than that is, is not just the greater good, but the, the good that they envision is so far beyond what is. Um, you know, when he says um, that it, it's not even that they're trying to repair some kind of a degradation in society and get us back to a previous, like never in the history of the world, right? I mean, if we take you know, King for an example, right? Uh, never in the history of the world has there been racial justice. Right. Right. Um, and, and yet, there's a vision that says we can live in a world that's just for everybody. Never, never in the history of the world has there been economic justice. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, right, like, you know, you can, you can run down the list. You could say, like, it just, it just has never, there's never been a, a place where over a sustained period of time for a massive number of people, um, and and these and these idealisti magdolim, the great idealists, see that world and tear down the world that they're living in because of the gap. Doug. Yeah, I I I see this as uh, potentially as as a critique, a criticism. Um, I mean, the the idiom is is allowing the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Um, and, and think about it in terms of the French Revolution, uh, with with the the idealistic vision of of, of a, a world of equality and, and liberty and fraternity uh, that ended up, you know, doing tremendous harm. Yeah, and this is um, you know, yes. I mean, and that's I think that's exactly kind of the, the danger here. I mean, somebody, um, the other night when we were processing in small groups, um, someone brought an idea from Thomas Friedman of, of conflagration, that at a certain point, there's enough factors come together um, that, you, that a, a bonfire erupts. Um, and one of the other participants in the group kind of asked, well, is that, does Friedman say that's a good thing or a bad thing? And um, the woman who had raised this kind of paused and she said, well, he doesn't. Right, and, and, and we know that fire can be a constructive force or a destructive force. Um, and I think what you were saying about um, the perfect being the enemy of the good, um, right? I mean, these idealists would, um, and this is again just in Ralph Cook's telling, this isn't a particular statement about a particular individual, but as a class, these idealists would rather see the world burn than see it continue as it is. Right, um, you know, this is this is the inclination that says when people start talking about coronavirus and they say, "Oh, when are things going to go back the way they were?" Like this is the voice that says, "I don't want things to go back the way they were." Mm -hmm. Not that like I want the pandemic to continue, but I don't want to go back to a situation in which we can easily ignore the impact of our decisions on the rest of the world. Um, you know, this is this is the you know these are the the teenagers protesting climate change. Who, when people say, "Well, if we did that, it would crash the stock market," who say, "Fine, crash the stock market and get the carbon out of the air." Right? I'm I'm willing to blow up the world economy if it stops climate change. Right? I mean, that's the that's that's this inclination that says, um, you know, damn the consequences, justice now in all of its forms. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that he uses an English word, even in writing the Hebrew. Which English word is that? Uh, idealism. Oh, idealism. Or the idealists. Um, 
Yeah, there's a couple of places in here where he does that. Um, and I, you know, I, I, there's a couple of, there's a couple of possible explanations. I don't know which is right and, and they're not mutually exclusive of one another. Um, it's possible that he just doesn't have a suitable Hebrew word. Cause I'm thinking about like, you know, the, the, the ways I could think of that you might express idealism in Hebrew um, would probably have different connotations to people who were learned in Jewish text, in traditional Jewish text. He doesn't want to have people misapprehend what he's saying. Like, like um, you know, the term Sadiq would have all kinds of connotations that he doesn't want you to to bring in here because you would misapprehend what he's talking about. Um, that's one possibility. The other possibility, because there's, there's another place where he says um, principi, meaning principles. Um, and it's also possible that he's being a little bit tongue in cheek or ironic in his use of that. Um, he says on the one hand, these are idealists. On the other hand, they're setting the world on fire. And, and, and don't forget the context, right? He's writing this in, I think, 1915. Right, so, so the world is literally burning um, because of ideological anarchism. Um, we're, we're in the midst of, or we're at the beginning of a string of revolutions in Russia that's gonna culminate in the Russian revolution of 1917. Um, and he's in Switzerland as Germany and France have massed the largest and deadliest armies in the history of humanity to pit against one another, uh, to move the line backward and forward 100 feet at a time. Um, you know, so, so when he talks about idealists demolishing the world, um, you know, I don't, there's not a lot that's theoretical for him. But he's actually watching ideology tear the world apart. Um, and, I, and I think prefiguring an even deadlier and more terrible um, ideological destruction to come. Uh, but he continues, Hamu'ulim, the best or the most excellent among these idealists, also know how to rebuild the world that was destroyed. But the lesser ones, whom the idealistic inclination has touched only tangentially, they only destroy and demolish. And they are the ones who are rooted in the world of chaos in its lowly state. So, so he's, he's distinguished first between the world of order and the world of chaos. Um, and then he's distinguished between the inclination to chaos that comes out of carelessness and anarchy and the inclination of chaos that comes out of the awakening of a higher spirit, what he's describing here as idealism. Um, and then he's distinguishing between those idealists who are capable not only of tearing down what doesn't suit their vision of what a perfected world would look like, but also capable of putting something in its place, um, right? Um, you know, Gandhi potentially is, is someone we could think of as an example of that. Um, and, you know, and there are those idealists who see what could be and tear down everything and then shrug and don't know what to do instead of it. So, so where does this sit with you? True. Sure. Okay, sure. One of the questions that come up, and perhaps Cook deals with it in other places, but is how powerful is the force of entropy? Uh, the, the question is, once you enter into a state of chaos, even if the intention um, is to repair, uh, 
is is chaos containable or does it take on a life of its own well i think you know if you mean by entropy that systems inevitably break down over time um then in that sense i think you know both the the those people who identify with the world of order and those people that he's identifying as idealists um, are both in their way responding to that breakdown of system over time. Um, the difference would be that the in the world of order, you would want to resist that entropy by slowly shoring up and incrementally shoring up what you've already built. Um, you know, it's the difference between renovating a house and tearing it down and building a new house, right? Like over time, the house is gonna break down and decay and things are gonna break and they're not gonna work right anymore and so on and so forth. Um, but if you look around the city, you see in some cases people are renovating and in some cases people are buying decrepit houses, tearing them down and just putting up something new on the land. Um, the renovation is the world of order, the tear down is the world of chaos. Yeah, but it, 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 so my, my question is, is it sounds like um, Cook is suggesting that there, there is a, a good kind of perfectionist uh, or, and a bad one uh, or idealist. Uh, there, there are greater ones. and lesser. I don't know if he would use good and bad, but there are the greater idealists are capable of putting something in place of the world that they tore down. The lesser idealists are not. Okay, well, I, I get that. And, and the notion of the lesser idealists, it, you know, is, is implicitly destructive. The question in my mind is, I mean, the, there's, there's a couple of dichotomies here. There's that dichotomy between the, the greater and lesser idealists, but there's also the dichotomy between uh, those who, who promote a world of order and those who, who promote idealism, um, and they seem to be in attention. And my, my question is, is that once you, is in fact, any time you, uh, you move towards destruction of the, the world of order and open the door to chaos, is there anything that enables you to turn back to a world of order, which seems implicit in the description of the of the uh, the greater idealists. And yes, my question well, is, is well, chaos so powerful that regardless of your intention, is it going to overwhelm you? Right. No. Cook believes that it is possible to create this kind of chaos and then put a new order in, in its place. Right. I mean, that's you know his. I you know I I mean I think we can. That there's a there's a, a very important debate to be had about whether we believe that he's right about that, but he certainly believes that it is possible. Um, you know what what he doesn't quite talk about is um, how numerous and how prevalent are these great idealists, you know, and and what right and our and our assessment of the dangers of idealism will depend on our estimation of how many of the idealists are likely to be, um, you know, the kind who are capable of building something in its place. Sheila? You have to unmute, Sheila. Okay. Um, so what I, what I don't see in his text, and actually where I thought he was going, is the possibility that idealists might be able to see enough, enough good, um, enough strength, enough holiness in what exists to rebuild without tearing down everything. Yeah, so he, so he doesn't think the idealists can do that. Right, the, um, the, the, incre not the incremental, not that they can't do that, but they won't do that. Like the incremental approach that says, you know, 
America is the freest society that has ever existed. And the fact that that freedom is not applied equally to all people means that we need to, you know, run for office and pass bills that will reform the criminal justice system and, you know, and, and um, you know, rest educational disparities and so on like that all of that is still the attitude of the world of order right because people are people are running for office and people are passing legislation and people are raising money to support the school district and all of that stuff um you know it's um it, as opposed to an attitude that says um you know, we should, we should shut down the Pentagon to fund reparations for black Americans, right? That, that's the world of chaos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in its, in, in, in its seeking back, kind of, you know, in, it, in its desire to leap to, um, you know, right, you know, the, the voice that says the, the solution to the unrest in the streets is, reparations and single payer health care and a universal basic income um you know that's that's no longer the world of order because it's such i mean that you couldn't get from where we are to there without tearing a lot of things down right and you know and the voice that says um you know we're gonna we're going to end mass incarceration and we're going to reform the criminal justice system and we're going to create re-entry programs for returning citizens um, you know, that work is as vital and important as that work is, um, an, an attempt to reform the system is still a, a response from within the system. It recognizes the injustice, but it's an ordered response that says we're going to use the, we're going to use the tools of the world of order to fix the world of order, as opposed to we're going to disorder the world and put something else in its place. And that's the... <clears throat> that's the dichotomy that Ruff Cook is, is playing with here, right? Like within, because within the world of order, there are people who are invested in maintaining the status quo, and there are people who are interested in changing the status quo. Mm -hmm. but, they, but they share a, an inclination toward the existing order. Um, and and the, the idealists that Ruff Cook is talking about um, look at the existing order and they say, no, the problem is not, um, you know, the problem is not mass incarceration that disproportionately uh, surveils and punishes black bodies. Um, the problem is capitalism itself. The problem is government itself, right? I mean, you know, if we really kind of take this to the extreme, right? Like if we had no government and we had no police, we would have no problem. Right? Which and 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 those ideas were current in Ruff Cook's time. What about if okay, if we had a different type of government rather than if we had no government? Well, I, you know, I mean, then it depends on how different a type of government is, right? But, but remember, I mean, Rav Cook is, is living through the heyday of anarchism as a legitimate political ideology, where there are philosophers who are writing anarchist, anarchist manifestos, and there's, there's this belief in, you know, we can have a... a an egalitarian world with no government and nobody is over anybody. And I, you know, the 20th century bears out the pro all of the, the problems with that. Um, but, you know, in 1915, I, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's an anarchist who shoots, it's not anarchists who are gassing each other in France. But those are, yeah. It's a monarch. It's an imperial monarchy on one side and a republic on the other. Um, so you know, so I, I I don't know in you know in the early years of the twentieth century if that idea of government is the problem mm -hmm. if that would have seemed quite as crazy as it seems to me now. What did he think of the kibbutzim? I mean, he talks about the mechablim, but he doesn't talk about the chalutzim. So 
but he took this job and other people didn't want to be the chief rabbi. It was a bold thing to do that for an Orthodox man. Um, he took it. So he, I, mean, I don't know really that much about him. Did he, did, are those the idealists that he might be speaking about who really change the order of how you raise children and how you apply work and distribution of income and resources? Well, so, so first of all, I want to say Yehuda Mirsky's biography of Rav Cook um, is a, a masterpiece and it's under 200 pages. Um, so anyone who's interested in delving into the background of who he was and, the, and how his world shaped him and how he shaped the world that came after him, um, you know, I mean, you can, you know, you could, you could read it in a Shabbos um, and, it's, and it's an incredible work of scholarship. Um, hard, hard to get through, but he does a better job than anybody else in actually conveying some of Rav Cook's, as, you know, like, like you actually can start to get a sense of how this man thought, which is not easy to do. You have the Hebrew in front of you, let alone to do it in English. Um, but, but Valerie, your, your, your core question is incredibly perceptive. Um, all, I, I believe that this essay in its entirety is about the tension between the chalutzim on the kibbutzim in the early 20th century and the rabbinic establishment of the old yeshuv in Jerusalem. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think I'm, I'm personally convinced, but I think we at least have to allow for the, the real possibility that when he talks about people who are associated with the world of order, he's talking about the rabbinic establishment. And when he talks about the people who are from the world of chaos, he's talking about these 19 year old Marxists who are farming in Israel and you know, wildcatting settlements and talking about building a Jewish state. Um, Right, where and and the rabbis of the old yeshuv in their fur hats and their silk coats are are waiting for the Mashiach to bring all the Jews back. Right, like like uh, you know it's, it's I think it's impossible. It, it would seem to me impossible to claim that Rav Cook isn't talking about that on some level. Um, I don't think it's the only thing he's talking about. Like this isn't. Um, like just like a Ramana Clef where he's he's talking narrowly about this one issue, but but it's impossible to me that he doesn't have in mind on the one hand the difficult relationship he has with the other established rabbis in Jerusalem, and on the other hand, the difficulties he's having in reaching the Jews who are setting up the pre-state of Israel in Ottoman Palestine. Um, like he, he, he just has to be thinking about that. While he's, I'm sure, thinking about so many other things. Um, and, and with that in mind, um, look at what he says next, because this is really. Um, this is, the souls of chaos are greater than the souls of order, much greater. They speak a lot from reality, more than their faculties can bear. They seek a very great light. Whatever is constrained, accounted, and ordered, they cannot bear. So Valerie, if this is about the kibbutzim and the rabbinic establishment, whose side does Rav Cook take? The, the halutzim, the pioneers. Yeah, I mean, that's... This is this is where you get these glimmers of just how radical he was in some ways, um, and, and by the way, in other ways, not radical at all. Um, there has not been a single conversion that has taken place in um, there has not been a single Orthodox conversion, I should say, um, in Latin America since the 1920s. Um, because a rabbi sent a question to Rav Cook asking about some difficulties they were having with conversion. And Rav Cook's response was, you know, under the circumstances, you shouldn't be converting people at all. And there hasn't been now in a hundred years, almost, a single Orthodox conversion in Latin America because of that. Um, so, you know, Rav Cook himself has some deep investments in the world of order. Um, and, and yet, 
on a spiritual level, he looks at this and he says, you know, the great rabbis in their Bekishas and their, and their Shrimals, Yerushalayim, have nothing on the, the free loving, shorts wearing communists who are setting up the kibbutzim. They are the loftier souls actually. Um, and I wanna acknowledge also there's something, um, I wanna just acknowledge kind of the, there's a, something a little bit, I don't know if patronizing is the right word, but there's like a way in which um, Rav Cook is deciding who these people, you know, he's co-opting them into his own project. Um, you know, and, I, and so I don't know that he's really seeing them for themselves or recognizing them on their own terms versus, um, you know, co-opting them and dragging them into, um, like dra dragging them into what he's looking for. Um, but I guess but just before we go on, like, how does that sit with you, um, this idea that the souls of chaos are greater than the souls of order. True. I, I, again, I think it comes back to your definition of chaos, simply because, I mean, we were talking about the Chalutzim. I, they may, they may be endorsing a chaos of a, of a kind. It's a dialectic, though. It, it, it's in opposition to an existing uh, All right, give me one second. Yeah. That doorbell. That was unmistakable. Yeah. All right, Doug. Yeah, so uh, we, we were speaking earlier of of those who endorse chaos but don't have a vision of how to perfect the world um, or aren't or they think they have a vision but aren't actually capable of doing it yeah it's my, it's, my it's the latter and we need to be careful about that they have a vision right. but they lack the ability to carry it out my 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 sense is that that this 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 description of, of souls of chaos is on a is a much much higher order than simply alternative ways to approach the details of, of politics and economics. Um, well, and because the alternative approach of how to of the details of politics and economics is still that like that world of order from right exactly. Um, so it's, so when when. Uh, when Cook is talking about souls of chaos here, I mean, if anything, it sounds to me like an endorsement uh, of the Hasidic project, but at a very, very high level. Right. Well, that's part of Rav Cook's background, right? It is in um, coming from this kind of split Hasidic, non Hasidic family and being influenced by both sides. Um, I think part of what he wants us to understand is that the soul that is, the soul that can satisfy itself with how things are, right? Even if how things are isn't great, right? even, the, even the one that says, well, you know, there's problems in the world, but overall, you know, this is the, this is the, this is the best achievable system that we have. And so we just have to keep working to improve the system. Um, you know, I think what he's saying is that a soul that can satisfy itself with that way of looking at the world will never reach the greatness of a soul that says, no, things could be even better than they are. Um, the flip side is that that soul that says, you know, things are mostly as good as they can be and so we'll work to reform the system will also never cause as much damage. 
right? And, and, I think, and I think that he wants us to understand that there's a trade-off here that's linked. Like the, 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 the higher the striving, the greater the risk of it going awry. You know, and, and you can see that on some level, um, you know, in terms of what we know now about the experience of the children who were raised in the children's houses on the kibbutzim. Um, and you see that writ large when you look at the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution for that matter, right? You know, there's the, the um, Um, people who want to go to Harrisburg to reform the criminal justice system, we're not going to get beheadings in the street out of that. Thank God. Um, you know, revolution, um, you know, revolution gets you Lenin and Lenin gets you Stalin. I mean, that's, you know, and, and, I, and I think he, 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 I think he wants us to recognize the danger there. Right. Um, you know, if you play with fire, you might get burned. And if you play with a big fire, you might get really badly burned. Um, and, and yet, he, he also wants us to recognize that it is, it is better to seek greatness than to shrug. There's a, a third possibility. Okay. Is to try to work with, is to try to work with what you have with some passionate desire to make some changes. And I, um, it's, it's a little bit dis discouraging given our current situation, um, you know, not, not to find that in, in this text. Which I realize it's just one text, but but you know, well, I think about how a lot of it applies to where you know where we are now, and the, you know the sense that there needs to be some profound change. Yeah, I think you know, I think the response to that would be, um, you know, if you look at what happens to reform-minded politicians who get themselves elected, um, <laughs> how often do they change the system, and how often does the change them um right and, and i don't say that to be cynical i mean i just think like there's a there's an empirical question there um that it's it's very hard um you know even if you think about um what are the 435 seats in congress how many congress people would you have to put in there who, who shared a vision before you could really change the course of the body. And, and if you are too far below that threshold, how long can you hold on to that idealistic vision before you know, you're taking money from corporate PACs too? And you're rationalizing it to yourself by saying, look, you know, it, if I don't do this and I don't get reelected, I'm gonna do nothing for my constituents. So better to play the game and do what I can to help my constituents, right? I mean, that's, right, and that's the world of order. And, and that's, you know, and, and I mean that, I, you know, I mean, think about this because of all the direct mail that I'm sure you got, like I got about the primary election. Like, I have Rahmanis for politicians. You know, because I think, you know, you, it's like you start out like one, Wanting to help society and wanting to help people, and then you have to go and do all of kinds of, you know, just unpleasant things to get the job done. Um, and I and I and I don't think for most of our representatives, I honestly believe that that basic inclination to serve the public good has never never goes away. You know, it's there, um, but, but that's what systems do. It's systems uh, assimilate you into them. They're, they're meant to do that. They're designed to do that. Um, and, you know, and, and that's why, I say, you know, and it's, um, 
Oh, so, you know, and, and like sometimes revolutionary ideas managed to un de revolutionize themselves. Somebody was telling me that David Brooks had a column recently where he was talking about being in favor of reparations. And it's like, okay, if David Brooks is in favor of reparations to black Americans, like there's a shift in the conversation now. Um, but something, something changed from when this conversation started 50 years ago. And it was a radical fringe thing that, you know, mm -hmm. things, so, so sometimes you can get a, a radical idealistic idea into the world of order without killing people. Um, or sometimes. Yeah. But sometimes there can be change that that occurs outside the realm of government. Sure, but I think again, like Rev Cook is, is still gonna say to you- He's talking about the, the, the larger political sphere. No, he's not only talking about politics, um, but think about again, um, you know, how, many, how many decades of, you know, kind of academic and, and kind of organizing feminism did we have before we got a Me Too movement that actually managed to get people's speaking engagements canceled because they had abused women. Right. Um, you know, there, there, there are limits to incrementalist change. Right. And, and, and it took on some level, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of women taking to the streets um, and refusing to be silenced and refusing to be bought off and refusing to be fearful, um, right? I mean, you know, there's, there was a revolutionary impulse there. Um, you know, and I, and I think that, again, I mean, I think Rev Cook is sharing all of this without judgment. There's nothing wrong with working from within the world of order to make things better. Um, but he wants you to understand the limitations of that approach. Just, just like he has to acknowledge the dangers of revolution. And, and he couldn't have missed for himself the dangers of, of ideology in his own day. Doug? Yeah, um, you know, there's, there's at least the scent of messianism in this. Um, do you, believe or has has Rob Cook indicated that it is possible to have a greater soul of chaos among humans yeah well so I think there's more than a hint of messianism here I skipped a couple of slides uh, to take us to this one um, so here when he says they he's talking about um, these kind of um, what he describes as as insolent souls who are are lashing out at the world of order, uh, they are ever more apparent at some end of days in the period before the birthing of a new world, preceding a new and wondrous creative existence, on a plane beyond the expansion of boundaries, on the cusp of birthing a law beyond laws. On the cusp of redemption, insolence grows stronger. The generative storm rages on, breach after breach bursts out. Um, so I, you know, so I don't think there's a hint of messianism here. I think this is very explicitly a, a messianic worldview. Um, and, and I mean that messianic like with a lowercase m. This is a, a worldview that envisions a a radical and kind of supernatural redemption of the world. Maybe supernatural is the wrong word, but like a, a cataclysmic redemption that that brings everything to an end in favor of some other way of being. Um, and, you know, and, and, and his phrasing here is also, um, kind of very telling, at some end of days. Um, on the one hand, it's a messianic vision. On the other hand, it's not 
a vision that there's going to be a Messiah who's going to come once. He said everything, there are these, um, you know, what we would call apocalyptic times that, that we cycle through. Um, and, and in those apocalyptic times is when the chaos breaks out. Um, that's when the unrest breaks out. Um, and it's, and his, um, you know, and, and again, I mean, his Hebrew is so rich here. But Tukufa Shalif Harat Olam, the period before the birthing of a new world, um, He's not talking about the creation that, you know, God speaks nice poetry and things happen. Um, he's talking about birth, which is painful and messy and dangerous. Right, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's such a deliberate choice on his part um, to say, like, we're not talking about the the divine engineer who's going to take out his t square and draw the world and it's all going to be pretty and right he's he's talking about a new world coming into being and a process that is dangerous and messy and painful and potentially deadly Sheila, are you trying to unmute? I'm, I'm trying to unmute you. Okay. I, yeah. No. <laughs> Sheila, what's on your mind? Oh. Uh no, I'm not trying to, I wasn't trying to unmute. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It looked like you were trying to say something while you were on mute. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to. I was just seeing high holiday la language. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, so yes, right. You know, it's, I mean, he's drawing on the richness of that. Um, you know, and of course, right, he would have known that by heart. Um, I think what's, you know, but what's interesting there is that the High Holiday Liturgy is entirely backward looking at this like birth of the world as a thing that happened once and here we are. It's, um, you know, it's like very, I mean, it's kind of pseudo Aristotelian in its, in its worldview. Um, where Rav Cook is definitely not, right? This, this birthing of the world is a, it's an iterative process. It happens every so often in human history. It's not a one and done. Um, so, so he's both referencing the holiday liturgy, but also manipulating it or, or, or investing it with a different, shade of meaning than it would have had on its own. Just clipping through. I don't think we're going to look at the rest of the text. Um, what I'll do is I'll have David um, I'm going to give David a PDF to link in the econ um, that'll have the full essay in Hebrew and in English. Um, because I think I, we've had a good discussion and and you've gotten the the point of it. The um, ultimately where he ends is with a belief that um, the end result result of these storms of revolution is a greater achievement for society. You know, and I don't know if he, you know, if he had lived to see what would become of the 20th century. Uh, Rav Cook died in 1935. 
Um, you know, I wonder, I wonder what he might have said later about all of this um, if he had lived longer. Um, but any, and he was old. I mean, it was, you know, it just, that was his time. Um, but I, I think that our historical experience of the last 75 years-ish um, should cause us to question Ralph Cook's adamant belief that, you know, it's better to go through the storm and emerge on the other side, um, or that what emerges out of the storm is necessarily better than what was there before. Um, I think in that sense, he is himself one of, uh, an idealist. But, but I, I think he actually has something to say about what's happening today because we as a synagogue are going through exactly that process of questioning and and bringing some disorder to a world of order right now. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I mean, I, I continue to teach this because I think that, it, you know, it's whatever is 105 years later, it's still incredibly relevant. Um, I think I'm a little more skeptical than he is that it'll all, you know, the revolution always works out in the end. Um, you know, and, and there's that much more to be said there about um, the inclinations toward order and chaos within us and the way in which you know, systems become self-preserving, even the systems, even, even the revolutionary systems, um, you know, at a certain point become self-preserving. And there's all kinds of questions also to reckon with about, um, you know, I, I read, um, I recently read Persepolis, um, which was the, the graphic novel memoir of the Iranian revolution. And, um, <clears throat> right, you know, there's a whole other set of questions about um, not everyone who speaks the language of ideology is in fact an idealist. Um, and not, right, not everyone who speaks the language of idealism really means it. And, that, um, and that's Orwell's critique um, in 1984, right? That's doublespeak. Um, is, you know, is the, the use of language to obscure um, rather than to elucidate. Um, you know, I've never thought about that. Um, in this way, but thinking about, you know, kind of Orwell as a counterpoint, um, Orwell as a counterpoint to, um, to Ruff Cook. Um, you know, and there's a complicated picture, right? Because he went, he went and fought in the Spanish Civil War. Um, But there's a but he he offers us a deep skepticism about the promise of revolution. Um, you know, in a way that I think Ralph Cook, um, you know, might say yes. You know, the world of the world of order, um, the world of order is in the aggregate safe safer. Um, but I think, you know, we can look around us and we can see that it's not safer for black people. Right. And, you know, and that's, and that's attention is like, do you, know, what, what do we do if it takes, um, you know, and, and conscious of this, you know, in terms of the way the conversations that people will have, um, we had these conversations after tree of life and people would say to me, you know, we should have uniformed police officers at the door to the synagogue. Um, and that's hard, right? Like the sight of a uniformed police officer gives a lot of white people a sense of safety and security um, and brings a lot of fear to people of color. And so like, what, what do you do with that? You know, how much, and here I'm talking about the feeling of safety, not the actual safety. How much of the feeling of safety are white people willing to give up um, in exchange for an increase in the actual safety of people of color. And does that, 
make more or less safety for society in aggregate. Um, and, you know, if more safety for society in aggregate means less safety for the people who have always been safest in this country, um, these, these are not easy questions. You know, and I, and I think that that's kind of Ruff Cook's um, defense of, of idealism and his defense of revolution is, um, you know, the structure will protect it, the structure, the world of order will protect its insiders first and best. Um, and, and, but then whenever there's an insider, somebody's been left out. And what the, what the idealist wants, even if they can't quite make it happen, but what the idealist wants is to get a different system where no one's left out. And, and, I, and I wonder if you can get from a system that preferences some over others to a system in which everyone has enough can you ever get that system that privileges some over others to turn into a system in which everyone is cared for? Um, or do you have to start over to get there? And if you have to start over, then there's really some work to be done to figure out, well, who are the people who can, who can take things apart and put them back together again? I mean, think about, um, my mom, when we were renovating the house that my mom lives in, um, she had them take the back of the house off brick by brick so that when they finished the renovation, they could mix the old bricks and the new bricks. Um, you know, the house was expanded. Um, they could mix the old bricks with the new bricks so that it would, um, you know, it wouldn't look like, oh, there's like the bright line of where the new part of the house starts. Um, you know, it's not every Mason who can take half of a house apart brick by brick and then stack the bricks up and then put them back again. It's much easier to come in with, uh, you know, with one of those um, claw things and just rip the side of the house off and chuck it all in the landfill. Um, but, but I think that's what, but that's what, but that's what, Ruff Cook is, is saying, right? I mean, that the, the greatest idealists can take things apart in a way that they can put anything back up again. I'm thinking of, it's, what is it, the Mamula Mall in Jerusalem where they took out the bricks and they numbered them and then they put them back with the numbers showing. Have you seen <laughs> I didn't know that story. <laughs> Oh, I feel like there's that's that's Israel in two sentences. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, magnificent! Yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, it's 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 food for thought for a difficult week, and um, thank you all for sticking around to learn. And um, I'll be back next Thursday. Yashikoa. Yashikoa, have a good day. Yashikoa. Yashikoa.